How green can boaters be? I suppose that depends on how far you're willing to substitute work for money, and it's always a case of comparing what's possible with what's practical. Some liverboards simply want to transfer their land lifestyle to the water, complete with dishwashers, tumble dryers, and all the par-hungry impedimenta of modern life. If that's your approach, I would only say that you're going to need a big generator and lots of batteries or frequent visits to marinas with electric hookups. For many liverboards, moving onto a boat is a bit of an ecological revelation. Perhaps for the first time in your life, you're seeing what resources it takes to keep you in the style to which you've become accustomed and exactly how much waste of all kinds you produce. Every resource, diesel, coal, wood, gas, food, water, has to be brought onto the boat by you, and every piece of waste has to be disposed of by you. Suddenly, you have a personal relationship with the means of creating heat and power, and you're not even shielded by the monthly direct debits which keep you warm and powered in your land-based home. So, what are you going to do about the best chance you'll ever have to put your principles into action and go green? Soon, every liverboard recognises that the biggest impact they're making comes from the diesel engine which powers the boat, and if not, the ever-rising price of diesel will remind them that uh, it's there. So, is there an alternative? Well, I even quizzed Sue Day of the Horse Boating Society on the practicality of horsepower. Uh, but as she rightly pointed out, CRT have to be asked for special permission to put a horse on the towpath these days, and the number of moored boats complete with TV aerials makes progress slow indeed. And even then, the cost of buying, keeping and caring for a horse are probably more than the cost of diesel. OK, so... How about electric boats? Well, the Electric Boat Association has been going for more than a century, and uh, at the end of the Victorian era, there were nearly 200 electric boats on the Thames, and most of them were small. The largest on the river was the 65-foot, 80-passenger Viscountess Berry, which plied the Thames until about 1910, when, ironically, she was converted to oil. Um, later on, during the 80s, Rupert Latham at Roxham developed the frolic electric GRP launch, but the electric, electric boat market has been slow to develop. There are a handful of narrowboats about now. The problem, you see, for a larger narrowboat is charging, because the normal diesel engine is key to providing the charge needed for domestic electrics, and an electric engine can't do that. One answer is charging stations around the canal network, and there's talk of some in London, but can you imagine the queues if electric boats caught on, and or they all needed to top up with a charge every time they moored overnight? Another answer, uh, used by a handful of boat builders on the canal, is a hybrid system, which uses an engine cum generator to charge the batteries, which in turn power the engine. A hybrid can extract from the engine a, a higher power than required by propulsion, and then the extra can be stored in the battery bank and provide the low propulsion demand with a, a pure electric drive. When the batteries drop off, you turn the engine back on again, of course. You still use a diesel, but not quite as much. There are also those who see the answer in solar power, and the solar boat company claims narrowboats are well suited to electric propulsion, due to the efficient hull shape and low canal speeds. It says solar panels can provide power for over a thousand miles of cruising um, each year for many decades, but that's not based on liverboard requirements. The figures are calculated around summer cruising. Even that company admits not many miles can be expected in the English midwinter, especially on a boat where accommodation um, is requires electric lights and there are appliances um, and that can use all or most of December's solar charge on its own. One small, small part of the UK system is using electric narrowboats as hireboats, castle narrowboats on the Mon and Breck, 
In Wales, say, their electric boats cover 18 miles on a single charge, but they rely on hooking up to shore power on a regular basis. One firm selling solar panels reckons that a 17-tonne narrowboat with 512 watts of solar power in June or July can travel 100 miles at 2 miles an hour. Of course, it'd take a couple of days to do that, but that's based on having at least half the roof covered with solar panels. So, if reality means most liverboards are going to have to come to terms with burning diesel, what else can be done? Well, the answer is lots, and I'd re recommend looking at a fascinating, if rarely updated, website, uh, which is a, a wealth of ideas on how to limit your enviro environmental impact. It's called Low Impact Life on Board. You Google it. Um, some of their solutions may be a bit much for modern boaters, but there are some fascinating insights. On refrigeration, the site suggests, for instance, that uh, one answer to the fridge using lots of power is to keep things cool inside sacks hung in the canal. Well, most of us are a bit doubtful about the cleanliness of such a practice, but uh, there are also some sensible suggestions about keeping things that need to be cool in the bottom of the boat. Many Liverpools will also use outside space as a fridge alternative during sub-zero temperatures. And of course, travel is a, a key question for many, and living on board without a car reintroduced me to the bike, and they are useful energy-saving tools, especially when sp speeding hot fish and chips back to the boat. Uh, storing them is always an issue, and I have uh, found folding bikes too small for my six foot two inches, some hang them from adapted car bike carriers on the stern, but I've ended up using the roof. If you're over the ever-retreating pension age, then you can get a bus pass, and that means no car's really necessary unless you need it for work. Even without free bus travel, the public transport system, system is often a usable alternative, at least in the cities. Now, most boaters use gas for cooking, but Caller and others have been steadily pushing prices ever upwards. So it makes sense to use alternatives, and during the winter, if you have a multi-fuel stove, it can save lots of gas. We use ours to bake potatoes in double tin foil in the fire compartment or the ashtray, as well as one-pot stews, casseroles, and even steaming a, a steak and kidney pudding on the top. Now, there's no doubt that the various form of, uh, forms of diesel heating systems are the cleanest way of keeping your boat clean, if not environmentally. Um, and that a, a multi-fuel stove is dusty and dirty to use and contributes to the uh, pollution in the atmosphere as well as diesel does. Uh, we had one installed a few years back and yes, it is dusty, but you're never cold even when it's minus 10 degrees outside, and the eco fan carries warm air the length of the boat, with kettles on the top providing most of our hot water as well as a place to cook. We tended to use coal, but many use little bit wood picked up along the towpath, and that means free heat and a much better carbon footprint. In the summer months, the stove goes out and we rely on gas cooking and barbecues. Now we've come back to diesel, a stove this time with a back boiler running our radiators and that's partly advancing age and trying to reduce heavy lifting but it's very comfortable. Power is always an issue on a boat and while solar power may not be the best way of powering your boat year round, it does make a reasonable investment if you want to minimise the length of time you're running your engine. We have four 80 watt panels and we recently added a, a 100 watt, it's cost us less than a thousand quid and over the nine years we've had them they are they've more than paid for themselves several times over. They're clearly most useful in summer when we can sit for two weeks without needing to charge from the engine but even in winter they add to the batteries. Others use wind power at about the same investment cost but it does, doesn't suit most people who move around the country. What about food? Growing your own is not impossible on a boat, but uh, it will usually be salad stuff in boxes or pots, tomatoes, lettuces, spring onion, 
can be sown in succession and I always try to have a small herb garden in pots. So you can help yourself, but you're never going to feed yourself. And then cleaning. Well, you can easily pollute the canal with the wrong commercial products and chemical cleaners. And the low impact site suggests that uh, vinyl floors, floors can be mopped with soapy water using washing soda if they're greasy. Carpets and rugs should be taken outside and beaten. Uh, car vacuum cleaners are generally unimpressive, unfortunately. But for washing carpets, use water with washing up liquid or sprinkle bicarb of soda and leave it for a couple of hours or longer, then vacuum it off. On wood, use linseed oil or pollux oil on floors and furniture. And for stains and elsewhere, using, use washing up liquid or white distilled vinegar. And there are all sorts of tricks. Um, washing soda dissolved in water, borax, equal parts of white vinegar and water and a spray bottle um, for your windows. Um, if your sink drain hose goes uh, straight outside, just pour boiling water down it rather than putting a sink cleaner down it. Um, and for washing dishes, there are plenty of eco products now available. And bicarb of soda uh, will clean ovens, of course. When it comes to stove, you can clean your chimney from above with a chain and clean the glass on the burner with wood ash and a, and a damp towel. Lighting can eat a lot of power on a boat, but there are alternatives. And uh, although oil and candles are used by some boaters, you have to be aware of the obvious fire hazards. So if you're going to use electricity, LEDs are now a no-brainer, really. Well, and then finally, we come to the uh, unavoidable topic, I suppose, of toilets. Now, I don't want to get into the cassette versus pump-out debate. I merely point out that cassettes are free to empty. There are some people who use composting toilets, and we recently became part of that revolution just over a year ago. Well, the verdict? Well, great. It doesn't smell. It's economical and it's easier than lifting heavy cassettes. Both pump-outs and cassettes normally use chemical blue to break down the solids and improve the smell. It's somewhat unpleasant and it's expensive. I can vouch for one alternative, uh, which once again came from the low impact site and that's using brewer's yeast. I know of people who've had problems with this uh, when switching from blue, but if you start with a new tank or a cassette it works well all through the year. It's best to leave the cassette for a day or two to break down the solids but the smell is no worse than with blue and it costs a fraction of the price with a thousand tablets selling for around a fiver and four going into each cassette. So there we are. We've mentioned toilets and that's obligatory as far as boating is concerned but you can certainly be much greener than you will ever be on land.